Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This week's portion is Beshalach. It means when he let go. It's Exodus 13, 17 through 17, 16. The Haftarah portion is Judges 4, 4 through 5, 31. And 1 Peter 4, 1, 5 is the Apostolic Scripture portion. The introduction. The Torah prefers to teach through concrete examples from the Word. Heed the Lord your God diligently, doing what is right in God's sight, giving ear to God's commandments, and keeping all God's statutes. <coughs> Excuse me. Exodus 14, 13 and 14. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, what he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. We've talked about this before. There is a difference between being afraid and fearing. And we've discussed it before and we've gone through that. And if you look up the meaning of the word in Scripture, it carries an alternative meaning and the alternative meaning means reverence. So being afraid of God, yeah, of course you would be afraid of God, but how many people today are really afraid of God? Two people so far raised their hands. Three, four. The rest of us are afraid. Rest of, what's this? The rest of us are afraid. The rest of you are afraid? You should be afraid of God, but you should also fear Him in the sense that you should respect Him. Because He's Almighty. He's described as that in the Word. He created everything that exists. Can we do that? No, we can't. In fact, there's anything that we do that we believe that we have created... We've only done it because He's empowered us to do so. And when we understand that we can't do anything without Him, things would be a whole lot better for us. And then maybe we would learn how to walk in His ways and do what He wanted. Moses gave this instruction to the children of Israel, and he's telling them that just stand there and watch what God is going to do and his redemption is at hand for them. So what was his redemption going to be? Well, this early in the book of Exodus, they're getting ready to have the plagues come upon Egypt. And then they're going to go free into the wilderness. I wonder if they would have left Egypt if they knew what was facing them in the wilderness and what was going to happen because of their own actions. But the fact is, is that what God did to Egypt, they didn't have any choice but to leave Egypt. <clears throat> that they were going to be forced out anyway. But yet even after they were forced out, Pharaoh goes running after them and decides he's got to bring them back because they don't have any more slaves. So he has to go out after them. That was Pharaoh's mistake. Pharaoh's mistake destroyed his army and brought Egypt down. Along with the plagues and along with this, I'm surprised that Egypt was able to persevere through it all, but yet they did because God had a purpose. God used Egypt for different things. But God also said, when you read it in different parts of Scripture, that he was going to bring punishment on Egypt also for what they had done to his people. And it wasn't just, he's not just talking about what happened there in the book of Exodus. Egypt also did things to the Jewish people throughout after that and through Israelites and however we want, whatever name we want to call them, and however we want to lose them. Today, no matter who you are, they call everybody a Jew, if you're there. They don't call anybody anything else. They don't call them Ephraimites, they don't call them Danites, they don't call them this, they don't call them that. Everybody's a Jew. Why? Because Judah was the predominant southern tribe. And God had given a specific blessing through Jacob to his son Judah that is still being fulfilled even in this day because we're all still waiting for the Messiah to make his appearance. He hasn't returned yet. How many people are going to believe that it is indeed the Messiah when he does come back? You know, people are going to go, well, wow, if he comes back in the clouds like he went and all that, then everybody's going to believe in him. That's not what it tells us in Scripture. We're told in Scripture that there will be people who will see him, 
will know who he is and will yet reject him. They will harden their hearts against him. They will refuse to accept him. That's other stupidity, but hey, that's a definition of mankind. You know, we're not smart. We think we are. We think that we're so smart that we're stupid. Because we don't realize all we have to do is do what God instructed us to do and everything would be fine. But that's not the way things worked out. From the very beginning, man has disobeyed God. And it just keeps multiplying itself over and over and over again. In Deuteronomy 3.22 it says, Do not fear them, for the Lord your God is the one fighting for you. Put God first. And God will fight for you if you put your faith in Him. He doesn't ask you to always stand by. He'll ask you to participate in the ongoing battle. And if you refuse to do it, you say, well, God's going to take care of it all, then we're lazy. We're not doing what God wants us to do. We're not standing up for Him. We're not following Him. We're not doing what He wants us to do. He'll take the lead and we have to follow he did that with Israel when they went into the land. He went ahead of them into the land. But Joshua and the children of Israel had to go in and they had to fight for that land. They had to fight for every inch of it. And they did not conquer all of it. They only conquered part of it. They fell short of the goal that God had set for them. But that's usually what happened. But man falls short. We fall short in this life. That's why we need a Messiah. We need a Redeemer in order to be able to make things right between us and God. If we don't have somebody to make things right between us and the Father, what are we going to do? Because the Father could just judge all of us and say, you've all fallen short the heck with you. That's it. I still remember when he told uh, Moses that he was fed up with the children of Israel, he was going to wipe them all out, and he was going to start all over with the children of Moses. We don't hear much about Moses' two sons or their family. They don't really rise to any place of predominance. When you think about it in the Bible, they're kind of lost in there. But we also have to remember that they were also half Midianite. When you think about that. And there was probably there was a resentment already back then between remember when Miriam and Aaron went and confronted Moses over his Cushite wife. And people think, well, the Cushite wife is different than the Midianite wife. No, when you read the historical context about that is they believed that they were one and the same. It was just a different description for them. So they and when you read some of the texts and some of the opinions about that confrontation between them, they only used his wife as an opening to confront Moses. Because what was the argument? That they didn't really follow up on the argument about his wife. They followed up on the fact that they felt that Moses had too much authority and that they were equal with Moses and that they had the same gift of prophecy. The funniest thing was, these words weren't coming out of Aaron's mouth, they were coming out of his sister Miriam's mouth. She was the one that was afflicted by God. Aaron wasn't. In fact, Aaron turned around and interceded, begging Moses to intercede with God on her behalf. Aaron was a follower. Obviously, he was a follower. He wasn't the one that wanted to do these. You know, he was the middle child. He wasn't the youngest child. <laughs> Apparently, Miriam had a very strong personality and probably overshadowed the other ones and didn't like the fact that Moses had been chosen for this mission, that she felt probably that she could do the same. But she was also described as being a prophetess and a leader of the women that were there. So she had a position that was there, but apparently it wasn't enough for her. But that's the same thing for a lot of people. They don't think they have enough power. They don't think they have enough power authority. You know, in the world to come, it's going to be up to God who he wants to have the authority and what he needs to do. And does he really need anybody else to rule over the kingdom to come other than the fact that the Father and the Son will both be sharing the throne and will be there in the New Jerusalem 
ruling in the world to come. And I'm not talking about the Messianic Age, I'm talking beyond that. During the Messianic Age, the Messiah Yeshua will rule. And people will defy him. People will defy the Messiah. And you kind of scratch your head and you go, well, why would they do that? How could they do all that? You know, and they, will they really accept him for who he is when he returns? Or will they make up different things about the fact that, oh, that can't be the Messiah. Look at him, he's wearing a dress. <laughs> you know? Look, look, look at that guy there, he's got long hair. He's got a really scraggly beard and all this kind of stuff. He looks like a homeless person. Be careful how you describe the individual and what they say because what are we told in the Bible that you can see that the, you know you never know an angel of the Lord can come in such a way that you would not accept him and would just reject him. I mean you have a perfect example of that in Sodom and Gomorrah when they went to the city of Sodom had the two angels in there well here were two angels servants of God that obviously Lot recognized for who they were. The men in the city didn't recognize them for who they were until it was too late. And even then, I'm not sure that they really recognized who it was because the city of Sodom was in such sin that their fate had already been sealed that was there. Of course, we know about Abraham's bargaining with the Lord over the fact that you know, what if there's 50 righteous people? But you notice is every time it went, Abraham kept dropping the number. He finally bottomed out at 10. And when you count how many people were able to come out of the city, you didn't make it to 10, and he even lost one on the way out. Lot's wife didn't follow through. Lot's son-in-laws, they thought he was nuts. You know, they didn't even bother. It is what it was, but Lot's the one who chose to go to Sodom. Abraham chose to go to the wilderness. I think Abraham knew where he was better off, where he could just be left alone and wouldn't have to worry about those things. It's always kind of thing when you think about, you know, okay, we're out here, we're in the southwest, we're not in a large city. They call it a city. I'm not sure if it really qualifies as a city. Maybe a large town, if you want to call it that. I've lived in big cities and places like that and things over the years and all that. And When we moved out here a long time ago, there was nothing. It was much smaller than now. You could drive from the former Kmart on Highway 70. You know how I said former? Because that was the only landmark you had. From 70 up to, you know, to where we lived. Didn't have Highway 70 as it exists today. It was just a four-lane road that barely was passable as you're driving out. And you're figuring, when we first were told the directions to get to the house where we lived, we kept driving and driving and driving, upsetting, going, where the heck is this place? You know, we finally found it. It wasn't so bad out, you know, it was a quiet area. There were very few homes out there. Now they've built more, now they've built a whole lot of homes. You couldn't see anything in between here and out there. They were just building the high school, and we thought it was a mall. <laughs> it looked like a mall. Come now. You know? You go back east, they don't build these artistic buildings for schools. You know, they, they don't do things like that. So, you know, all we have to do is do what God wants us to do. All we have to do is follow Him and do that. All we have to do is learn to respect Him and revere Him. And yet, to have a fear of him, a respectful fear for the one who created us and gave us life. He's also the one that takes life, too, at the same time. He created life and he created death. We're told that in the Word. It wasn't Satan. Satan didn't bring death about. God brought death about. 
Why did he bring death about? Because of the sin nature of man. But without that occurring, then sin could never have died. Sin would have continued on. But then he sent his son because he also had a plan from the very beginning. Because he knew what we would do from the very beginning. And yet he still created us. And sometimes I think when he told Moses that he was going to kill all the children of Israel and he was going to bring a new people up out of Moses' seed, I believe that it was a test for Moses. I believe it was a test to see what Moses' reaction was going to be. And every time that God was going to punish the children of Israel or do these different things for that, Moses always stood up for the people. Only one time did he get upset and get angry with the people and did the opposite of what God had told him to do. That's when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And he struck it not once, he struck it twice. So he lashed out at God when he was thinking that he was because he was angry with the people. It's the only time that we see that Moses got angry with them. Of course, the other time he got angry with the people, he did one more at the golden calf. He got angry with the people, but he also got angry with his brother. Because who made the golden calf? No, it was the fire. Don't you remember that famous response? It came out of the fire. It just jumped out of the fire. Yeah, and, and Moses probably just looked at him and go, well, you think I'm nuts? God had already told him what was happening down in the camp. So what did Moses do there? Moses got angry and he destroyed the two stone tablets. But it was a necessity that happened because somewhere along the way, God changed that initial covenant. Those initial conditions that he gave for the covenant because Moses had to go back up on the mountain for another 40 days and 40 nights. Why the need to do that if God was simply duplicating what he had already put on those two stone tablets? The second time out, as we know, First time out, God cut out the two stone tablets. God also engraved the two stone tablets. Second time out, Moses cut out the two stone tablets. God engraved the two stone tablets. I believe that God, the second time out, was now calling man to be a part of this covenant, to be an active participant. Not like the first time where God did everything and all man had to do was obey what God was doing. The second time out, man had an active part in having to keep this covenant and do what God wanted them to do. And they still struggled. They still struggled despite the promises that God made in the covenant to them about their status and what he would do for them. In Job, starting at chapter 1, verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, You consider my servant Job, <coughs> excuse me, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? And you have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I think Satan thinks he pulled a fast one on God with that. He didn't really pull a fast one on him. Not initially, because God still protected Job. He didn't protect anything else. So, Satan went out and immediately all his children were killed. And then, after all of these different things are happening, Satan goes back to God, he gives him a report, you know, blah, 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 and God says, you know, again, and Satan comes back with the response again, that you're protecting him. Let me strike him. And God gave him permission to strike Job again, but he told him, you can do what you wish, but you can't take his life. 
And he did. But yet, Joe did not deny God. Everybody else told him to. Everybody else recommended his good friends told him to do that. His loving wife told him to curse God and die. What you think? He had a will? <laughs> Leave him everything? He didn't have anything left at that point. But he kept faith with God and God blessed him abundantly in the end, giving him new family, new children, and a blessing that made him even more wealthy than he was before. And some people don't think that Job was actually a biblical figure, that it was just a made-up story that was in the we don't know. But they believe that they can probably date the book of Job to about the time of Abraham. They believe he probably lived during that period of time. But it shows us that if you keep your faith with God, everything will be fine. It doesn't promise you that everything's going to be perfect. It doesn't promise you that you will not go through trials and tribulations. God says he will test us. He uses Satan to test us. He will afflict us. He will do these things to us. Everything will not be perfect for us. So when somebody tells you that once you accept Yeshua as Messiah, that everything is going to be right with your life and everything's going to be perfect and everything bad is ever going to happen to you again, I would beg to differ according to Scripture. I would also beg to differ with the historical context, particularly of the apostles. Read about the apostles and what happened to them. These were the intimate disciples of the Messiah. And according to historical records, only one died of old age, and that was John. All the other ones were martyred. And some of them in such ways, I don't know how man came up with these ideas of how to do these things to them. You would think that the most intimate disciples of the Messiah, they would have the promise that they're sharing, here they're going around, they're making, bringing all these people to faith in Messiah, that everything would be perfect for them. Obviously not. Everything was not perfect for them. So if you look to their example and then claim that nothing bad is going to happen to us, we're denying the truth and reality of Scripture. And that's something we should be careful of. We don't want to do that. Because then we're, we have a seed planted in us that's not going to tell us the truth. And we need to keep that in mind. In Judges 4, 8 to 9 and 21 to 24, it says, Then Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. But Yael, or Jael, Heber's wife took a tent peg and seized a hammer in her hair, hand and went secretly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And it went through into the ground, for he was sound asleep and exhausted. So he died. Well, obviously, I would think so. <laughs> and behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. And he entered with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead with the tent peg in his temple. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the sons of Israel. The hands of the sons of Israel pressed heavier and heavier upon Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they just destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. So Barak comes to Deborah, who is a prophet or a judge of Israel. She's a prophetess, and she's also a judge of Israel. And he wants her to go with him while he goes to battle against the armies of Canaan and the other armies that are there in the land and against these kings that are there. She tells him that, you're going to win the battle. Why do you want me to go? Well, I want you to go with me. So she tells him that, well, if I go with you, then the honor 
of winning this battle will not go to you. It will go to a woman. Now, you would obviously think that the woman that she might be talking about is herself. But she's not talking about herself here. She's talking about Jael, Heber's wife. And that woman scares me <laughs> when I read about her in Scripture. She took a hammer and a tent wooden peg and hammered it through the guy's head and into the ground and he was so sound asleep he didn't even know what happened he didn't know what hit him that guy never woke up <laughs> hey she got him in there he went to sleep he was exhausted she went and got herself a big wooden hammer and took a tent peg and put it into his temple and did one boom right down there of course the reality is is that the human skull really isn't as strong as we believe that it is. That it can't, you know, in this reality when you when you're seeing it here, but even so, her being able to do that despite the fact that maybe the temple was not as hard as the rest of the skull or whatever, that's still something that's fairly, you know, that woman was strong. You know, if you think that women are the weaker sex, men be afraid. <laughs> be absolutely afraid. Especially when you're when the woman is shorter than you. <laughs> I love you, dear. <laughs> she may be short, but she's spunky. What? Does not go to sleep out of it? <laughs> Unfortunately, she goes to sleep before me, and then she'll wake up before I do a lot of times. It's very scary. <laughs> no, it's not. Nah. In Genesis 2, starting in verse 15 through 25, the Lord took God, the Lord God took the man, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God called a deep, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So the woman was created from the flesh of man, not from the dust of the ground. Adam was created from the dust of the ground along with the rest of the animal kingdom. They were created from the dust of the ground also. And among the animals... Adam could not find anyone that was a suitable helpmate for him. And God knew that Adam needed a helpmate. Now there is, if you read some rabbinical opinions and some other things about it, some people believe that Adam was a being created with both male and female parts in him. I don't know whether that's true or not or whatever. God took a part out of him and that part that he took out of him, he was able to fashion into a woman. And then man, Adam, realized that without her, he would be incomplete. And I'm sure that she also would come to the realization that she would be incomplete without him. That's the way that God created them in the beginning. He also realized that a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It would be through Adam and Hava that mankind would thus be brought forth through a man and woman coming together, 
rather than being created from the dust of the earth. Adam was created from the dust of the earth. So mankind was birthed from them and came forward from that. And of course, you always run across the uh, problem with the fact that uh, where did they wind up finding wives after that? Well, the reality is in Scripture that you have no alternative but to accept the fact that they probably had sisters, they had more children after that, and they married their sisters. You don't have any alternative but to do that. Some people would say, well, God created other beings. We're not told that in the Word. So we have to accept it for what it is and then realize that later on God forbids these type of relationships. And he gives down strict instructions to the children of Israel not to do that. But yet it's kind of interesting when you look in at the Israelites and you look at the tribe of Levi and you look at the priesthood. The priesthood can only marry within the tribe of Levi. They cannot marry outside of the tribe of Levi. So they would be marrying a relative within there. Now even though there were clans beneath the Aaronic clan, you know, uh, family, there were three different clans that were within Levi. They would be relatives. They would be related. So I guess it would have to be a faraway cousin or something like that in order to get around or not violate the Torah command that God would give you know, about who somebody could marry. And it always makes you think about the fact when you think about Abraham, he describes Sarah as being his sister, which is partially true because it's within his family that he marries. So what, did he actually marry his sister or did he just consider her to be a sister because they were relatives within there? There are a lot of things in the Bible that are hinted at, but a lot of things in there that you come to realize that God had to fix through the giving of the Torah because it wasn't going to be proper. It wasn't going to be there, but it was a necessity in the beginning for what God needed to accomplish and what God needed to do. It was funny there in the beginning that the man and woman were both naked before God and it says they were not ashamed. <laughs> Their eyes had not yet been opened. Or is that your interpretation of that passage there, Bruce? Yeah, I don't know. I, when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm not real happy anymore. <laughs> How would you think they... Adam felt and the other ones felt their pre-flood when they were living until their 900s and whatever... But they said they were of good mind and sharp eyes, so, you know. Still Maybe not as they were getting there, a little bit up there, you know, once you pass that into your 900s, everything goes water. downhill after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think about that. It could be three or four hundred years old and still be considered young people. Well, the 700 they weren't even teenagers yet. <laughs> Can you imagine parents back then? If the kids lasted that long, they were probably pulling their hair out by then. You're going, what are they going to grow up? Oh, give me a break. Around 200. Around 200? Well, I think I'm much later than that one. Think about it. You're having 200. You still got a child there, a toddler. When you get married, you'll figure it out. You'll experience it for yourself. And you'll see the truth. Just talk to Nathaniel. He's sitting right next to you. He'll tell you all about it. First Peter 4, 1 through 5. Therefore, since the Messiah suffered physically, you too are to arm yourselves with the same attitude. For whoever has suffered physically is finished with sin. With the result that he lives the rest of his earthly life, no longer controlled by human desires, but by God's will. Few you have spent enough time already living the way the pagans want you to live, in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, wild parties, and forbidden idol worship, they think it's strange that you don't plunge with them into the same flood 
of disillusionment. So they heap insults on you. But they will have to give an account to him who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. A lot of us have spent enough time living the way that the pagans do. You notice that they're called pagans here for doing all these different things that are there. I know some people who call themselves believers that do these things. So then they would stand, they would, thought, they would fall into the category of description, not as a believer, but as a pagan. Because they're still doing the same things that they should have put behind them when they became believers. So you can't say that you do these things, but I believe in the Messiah and everything is fine. If you don't endeavor to make a change in your life when you come to faith in Yeshua, then why would he extend to you the gift of eternal life and allow you to make it through the day of judgment? It doesn't mean that we're all perfect. We're far from perfect people. We still sin. We still have problems. But the difference is, is that we're trying to do our best. We're trying to overcome the sin nature. It's not an easy thing to overcome. Even with God's help, we're still struggling with this. Even when he gives us the rule of the Holy Spirit, we still struggle with it. It's true. But we have to struggle. We're supposed to struggle because that's supposed to make us into the people that God wants us to be. Because unless you struggle and God just hands it to you, you're going to take it for granted. And a lot of us have done that. We've been successful in life. We've done these different things. We've accomplished these different things. And then one day, it all goes, it's all gone. And then you think to yourself, my goodness gracious, you know, what happened? Why did that happen? I was a believer. I'm this, I'm that. Everything should be fine. Everything... It, well, the reality is, is that everything is not fine. That you have to work for your salvation. You have to work to overcome sin. You are saved by faith in Messiah, but it doesn't exclude you from obeying God's commands. That's why you need to internalize it in order to be able to live it out in your life without thinking about it all the time. That's why, ultimately, he's going to write the Torah on the flesh of our hearts and not on the stone that encases it. He needs to embed it in our flesh so that it takes root deep within us and so that we live it out without even thinking about it. That's the people that he wants us to be. That's the Israel that he's looking for. And I'm going to close with this. Torah man says, it is not the greatness of our troubles, but the littlestness of our faith that makes us complain. 